Arctic nights, the aurora often flames across the winter sky. What is it? And where does it come from? So we can now clearly see that the northern lights are actually tied to the north polar vortex and that the north pole is at the center of the flat earth and that the north polar vortex and this motion and the magnetic effects of the sun and the moon and the ether and the cosmic breath, the cosmic ray stream that moves like a breath around the earth is what's tied to the northern lights and what's causing it to spark off in the atmosphere like that. The northern lights are beautiful and odd and they've understandably inspired tons of myths over the years. Like the Vikings thought they were a bridge to Asgard where Thor and the other gods live. And another Norse legend says that they're the light reflected off the Valkyrie shields. And then people in Finland thought it was the Archangel Michael, John Travolta, fighting Beelzebub, the devil. It was actually Galileo Galilei, the famous early astronomer and recanter of science, who gave the Northern Lights their name, the Aurora Borealis, which in Latin means Dawn of the North. It wasn't until but Norwegian scientist Christian Birkeland in 1896 figured it all out that we came to fully understand what causes the Northern Lights. Mm -hmm. It's so hot that it exists in a fourth state of matter. There's gas, liquid, solid, and then plasma. And in plasma, ions, which are positively charged and electrons, atoms, just float freely around one another. Oxygen and nitrogen, the electrons transfer energy to these atoms and excite them. And to calm back down, the oxygen and the nitrogen have to shoot off some of this energy, which they do in the form of tiny packets of light called photons. Beautiful, beautiful photons. Depending on where in the atmosphere the electrons interact with the oxygen or the nitrogen, different colors will be produced. Like for example, oxygen up to about 150 miles will produce a nice yellow-green color when electrons bombard it. Above that, it emits a nice red color. And then nitrogen up to about 60 miles into the atmosphere puts out a really beautiful blue. And all these colors can mix together forming beautiful glowing pinks and purples and whites. It's like Miami Beach up there. According to the Bible, a cherub, or the Archangel Uriel in some traditions, was placed by God with a flaming sword. at the gates of paradise after Adam and Eve were banished from it Genesis 3:24 Painting by Ferdinand Victor Eugene Delacroix, expelling Adam and Eve with a flaming sword. Eastern Orthodox tradition says that after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, the flaming sword was removed from the Garden of Eden, making it possible for humanity to re-enter paradise. The Bible has much to say about the cherubim. I'd like to look at the cherubim that were stationed at the east of the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were exiled and the flaming sword that was there with them.
2, there's a description of the blissful life led by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, where they were allowed to eat the fruit of any of the trees, except the fruit on the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Unfortunately, Eve, under the influence of the serpent's lies, ate the forbidden fruit and persuaded Adam to do the same. Thus they became guilty sinners, disobeying God's law. They then became subject to the sentence that God had pronounced for such disobedience. Here are the words of Genesis 3 verse 24. So he, that's God, drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. When driven out of the garden, Adam and Eve lost the life of bliss that they'd enjoyed there, as well as the easy and close communication they had with the Elohim and with God through them. In particular, Eve would now have sorrow upon sorrow in bearing and raising children. And Adam would struggle with thorns and thistles in order to eke out an existence for himself and his family. They were also now condemned to die after a life of struggle and to return to the dust from which they were made. Another mythological flaming sword with immense destructive power. appears in Norse mythology. It is said to be wielded by Surtur, the leader of the giants of Nusbalheim, the realm of fire. So we can now clearly see that the Northern Lights are actually tied to the North Polar Vortex and that the North Pole is at the center of the Flat Earth and that the North Polar Vortex and this motion and the magnetic effects of the Sun and the Moon and the ether and the cosmic breath, the cosmic ray stream that moves like a breath around the earth is what's tied to the northern lights and what's causing it to spark off in the atmosphere like that. Also, we can see the biblical references and other mythological references that obviously tie into the actual workings and are actually closer to the the real workings of the Northern Lights than the scientific mainstream definition of it. I think Birkeland was right about the way that the magnetic streams work and that they're being interrupted there and that's what makes the Northern Light. So the Northern Lights are, as the Bible says, God's flaming sword put to guard the Garden of Eden. So it may be now possible to go back there and it may be why they're guarding the North Pole with the dew line. We also can see that the Norse mythology shows that he is the god of the lava, the fire world, Muspelheim. And so if you were to consider if you could go through the North Pole, what would be under there? would be Muspelheim and that he is guarding it with a giant flaming sword. And so the Northern Lights are the flaming sword of the North.
Thank you.